What's up everyone, Jason Turley here. And I've noticed that there's a lot of people who want to get into these low level hacking topics such as reverse engineering, exploit writing, or game hacking. However, they get intimidated by assembly language, right? Perhaps they already know how to program in C or Java or Python, but when it comes to assembly code, they just get overwhelmed and they give up and they get pressured. So in this video, I just wanted to share three tips that I've personally used to get over that initial fear of programming or even just reading assembly code, right? When you're in a disassembler like Ghidra or Ida Pro and you're just trying to gain your situational awareness. So these are three tips that I like to use and I believe that would be beneficial for anyone. Tip number one is to understand that assembly language, it really isn't as scary as you think. It's kind of a mindset thing. While different assembly languages have different numbers of instructions, so MIPS has about 100 or so instructions, ARM, which is another RISC language, has a few hundred instructions, and then x64 has about 2,000 instructions, well, break it down and realize you don't need to understand all of these. In fact, you don't need to understand most of them. I like to break it down into instruction types. So regardless of what assembly language, whether it's a reduced instruction set or a complex instruction set, realize that they all kind of fall into these instruction type buckets. First, you have your assignment operations like move. So set this equal to that. Pretty simple. Next, you have your arithmetic instructions. So like addition, subtraction, multiplying or dividing. And then you have the stack manipulation instructions, right? Have the stack grow or shrink. What push, add something to the stack, pop, remove it and save it in some variable. Memory addressing. So if you're familiar with C or C++, that has the concept of pointers, which store something at a memory address. You can dereference those pointers. It's the same in assembly. You can either load or store to different addresses. Next up, you have conditional jumps. These are your if this is true, then do that. So you have comparison instructions, you have jump. There's two kinds of jumps. There's relative jumps and there's absolute jumps. So go to this memory address or jump given a certain condition. So here I have J and Z jump. If it's not, if the zero flag is not set, or you have uh, branching, which MIPS uses they don't, I don't think they have the concept of jumping. They have branching, but it it's functions the same way. Then you have your function calls, simply just call. So call this function, right? Call printf, call string compare. There's more behind the scenes. It sets up and tears down the stack. There's different um, callee conventions, but we're not getting into any of that today. You have your bitwise operations. Uh, so manipulating binary code, right? And, or, not XOR or shift, shift left, shift right. So these are the buckets that I categorize them in. So even though you look at X64 that has thousands of instructions, they all kind of fall into one of these buckets. So mentally it helps you from being overwhelmed, right? If you see an instruction you don't understand, realize at its core, it's just one of these kinds of instructions. My second tip for you guys is to read the documentation. So regardless of what assembly language you are dealing with, whether that's ARM or X64 or MIPS or some type of Game Boy assembly, which I'll have some videos out on that soon, read the documentation, right? For ARM specifically, um, the resource I like to use is Zaria Labs. She has multiple training courses and she has tutorials. So I'm on her website. You can see the URL here. I'd click on Zira Labs tutorials and she just has a bunch of well-written and beautifully displayed tutorials. You can see them categorized here. You can click on the ARM instruction set, get familiar with it that way. And something else that she's done that's a game changer is made these assembly cheat sheets very detailed, very beautiful, and it's just an easy way to learn ARM, right? On the x64, x86 side, um, the go-to resource is typically just Intel. They put out these 
developers manuals so you can download it and they're quite beefy you see this is 4800 pages it's um a lot i don't really like to go through the pdf i th don't think it's it's just a lot i'd much rather use this website scroll to the top this website here from namas so i'm pretty sure i butchered that name i apologize but they have all the instructions formatted and it's just a cleaner way so if i wanted to get an understanding of what this instruction is blsr i'd click on it and it pulls up a table and some examples all right i think this is much easier to parse through than the pdf but that's just me so that's my second tip uh, this is true for not just assembly but any programming language right python C, C++. It helps to read the documentation, get some examples, and understand what's going on. My third and final tip is to practice reading and writing assembly code. While I was an undergrad, I took two computer architecture courses. And for the assignments, there was multiple times where we had to write assembly code. And emphasis on the word write. We had to do it with pencil and paper. We didn't always have a computer or an assembler to translate the code for us or error check it. Our professors would give us a bit of um, C code, like a snippet of C code, and we had to translate it in MIPS assembly by hand on paper. In the beginning, it was kind of brutal. There was a big learning curve involved, but in the end, it was a lot of fun to break it down and essentially become the compiler, right? You're becoming the assembler, the, the compiler. You're translating from a high level language to a low level a low level language excuse me now i don't recommend doing that for everything but when you're first learning how to do reverse engineering or you're first learning how to understand and read and write assembly that's a very good habit if you don't want to do it on paper then another good resource is godbolt.org it is a compiler explorer tool so you can see on the left hand side i have a snippet of c code it's just a function, it's an integer called add2. It takes one parameter, another integer called x, and then on line two, you see that it just returns whatever x is plus two. So if I pass in a variable, um, if I say, this won't work, I don't think it will, add2 10, this would print out 12, right? I mean, this is not a full, IDE or anything, it's just a compiler explorer, so that's why I'm getting these syntax errors. So on the left-hand side, you can type whatever code you want. I like C, but you could do anything from C++ to Erlang, to Go, to Haskell, and then you can pick your compiler, right? I'm just gonna use x64 for demonstration purposes with Intel syntax, and then you can pass in the compiler flags here. I have tac o zero, meaning no, optimizations right don't try to improve this code in any way shape or form so we see line three corresponds to line one of my c code it's setting up that parameter it's storing it in eax and then it adds two to eax eax is the accumulator register right the return value is typically stored in here so add two and then it returns so godbolt.org is awesome it's a great way to easily quickly translate your C code or whatever source code you have into an assembly language. But I don't like relying on tools all the time. I think they're great, but I think you should also know how to do this with a compiler. So I'll show you how to do that now. All right, guys, I'm over here in my Kali Linux virtual machine. On the left hand side, you see I have the same add to function that was in godbolt.org. And then I have my main function It declares an integer called Z and it assigns it the result of add to pass with the parameter 10. So 10 will take the place of X. So this will now be 10 plus two, which is 12. And that gets stored in Z. And then it returns zero. A zero error code in C and C++ just indicates that the function exited cleanly. It was successful. There's no errors, there's no issues. Whereas a non-zero error code 
which could occur if you pass the wrong number of arguments or a resource is no longer available, for example, it'll return a negative number, typically negative one. And if you want to check the status of the last command you ran, so um, if I do ls, right, it, it returns the directory listing. I can do echo dollar sign question mark and it prints out zero, right? Because it exited successfully. If I do a different command, like false, and then echo, it will return one, which is non-zero. So let's compile this. I like GCC, and it's just a standard compiler. There's also Clang, the C language compiler, but I'm gonna use the GNU C compiler. And I'm compile this with no arguments. And if I do ls tech l on it, it prints out a dot out. This is an executable file. I run file on it. So this is the executable, but I want the assembly code. So I could open this up in a debugger like GDB. That's one way to view the assembly code. A different way, let's look at the um, command line options, the different flags. I can pass tech s. Only compile it. Do not assemble it or link it. So GCC without any options does everything, right? It does the pre-processing, it compiles it, it assembles it, it links it, so it adds in all the different libraries, and it creates that .o file, that object file. I just want the assembly code, please. So GCC, tech S, and then add to, add to .c, let me clear the screen, so and zoom in. So only give me the assembly, turn off optimizations, and this is just personal preference. I like Intel syntax. I think it's neater than uh, AT&T. Oh, spelled that wrong. It's not NASM, it's MASM with an M. Now when I do ls tech l, I have my .s file. Run file on it, and it's assembly source code ASCII. Let's open that up in Vim. Give this, no, I don't want to do that. All right, okay, hopefully everything's clear on the screen. Okay, so this is the .s file. This is the assembly, the x64 assembly code. We see at the top, it tells us what file that um, this was compiled from, right? Add2.c, the Intel syntax, okay global so this is creating a function or a label and you can see here here's that label this is the same as lines one two and three over here right or i guess line one is just declaring the function name all this right here all that it just sets up the stack it allocates space every time you call a function space needs to be allocated and then when you leave the function when you exit that space needs to be returned. So for illustration purposes for this demo, I'm uh, not going to any detail on this. I'm gonna skip it. What we really care about is this right here, these four lines, which are very similar to what we saw on godbolt.org. We see a minus four from the base pointer. That's our parameter X, which is 10, right? We see that being stored in EAX. And then we add two to EAX. So 10 plus two, and then we return it. EAX is the accumulator register. Return values are usually stored there. So we return EAX, which is 12. And then down here is the main function. Similarly, this is setting up the stack space. So we do not need to really be concerned with it. It's even labeled nicely. You see start process and then end, right? Start and end. So all we really care about is here. We see EDI is set equal to 10, which is right here, our parameter 10. And now we add two to it, or we call the function add two. That is stored in EAX, but we see here we set EAX to zero. Why is that? That's our return value. EAX is always used for the return value. So if I leave the value of 12 in EAX, it's gonna get immediately overwritten. So we assign it uh, minus four from the base pointer, which is Z. Right. I wonder if I, can I add comments to this? That makes it a little bit easier, right? 
So this is add to pass with the parameter 10. And this is saying z equals 12, right? Return zero. If I really wanted to, I could comment the rest, but I think you guys get the point. And then just some metadata, I guess, the type of compiler that was used. So there you have it, guys. Those are my three tips to kind of get over your intimidation, get over your fear of assembly. You might never need to write assembly code unless you want to do some type of like game hacking. I know that Nintendo 64 uses MIPS assembly code. So, but for the most part, like me personally, I do a lot of reading assembly for the CTF challenges, for the reverse engineering, for exploit writing, for game hacking. I need to be able to read assembly. And when you kind of break it down, um, tip number one was breaking it down into buckets, the different instruction types, right? Assignment, arithmetic, stack, addressing, jumps, conditionals, bitwise manipulation. And secondly was read your documentation. Um, Google is always your best friend. It's the best tool you can use. And think like a compiler, tip number three. Understand what's going on. If you want to go in depth, just write little C snippets and use Godbolt or use your GCC compiler and look at the assembly. So let me know in the comments below, what are your tips for understanding and getting better at programming or assembly in general? As always, remember to leave a like or thumbs up and subscribe. It helps me out. Take it easy and see you guys in the next video.